Welcome. Uh, today is uh, yet another of our uh, friends seminar in the Informatics Friends series. Uh, today's speaker is Brenda Laurel, uh, who comes to us from uh, Neo Gaian Interactive, uh, formerly from uh, places that uh, include. Uh, Atari, Interval Research, Activision, Sun. Uh, she uh, co-founded uh, one of the, uh, the game company Purple Moon, which was based on her uh, research in gender in technology more than 20 years ago. Uh, she also uh, founded and designed the graduate uh, media program at Art Center College of Design in Pasadena and also the graduate design program. Uh, at the California College of the Arts. Uh, she's also been uh, recently an adjunct professor in uh, digital arts and stuff, stuff. At, uh, <laughs> stuff. Stuff. stuff at the University of California, Santa Cruz. And so with that, I'll turn it over to her to uh, tell us about uh, her vision for enlightened interaction, which I think is one of the most interesting ideas to come along in a while, so we'll see. Brenda. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you guys for coming. I appreciate it. Um, so these are some new ideas. Um, they're more sort of directions to point out further research opportunities than they are conclusions. So I hope you'll bear with me. I've been researching this topic for a while. Um, so here we go. Um, so this issue, while I was researching this talk, I discovered to my chagrin, is enormous. It's huge. Yeah, there are so many different dimensions to it. And today I'm just going to be presenting ideas that talk about some of the research that's already been done, but also some of the research that we need to do um, to make it a, a safer and more civil world out there in the great online frontier. Um, you know, we can't help but noticing those of us who are usins, the decline of civility in American politics right now. <laughs> what? 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 <laughs> you smoking crack? Um, and I think we've been seeing a decline in online civility happening for longer than some of you have been alive. Um, but let's start with a simple truism, or axiom, when you might say, a piece of jargon and see if it holds any clues. So this isn't somebody's gun collection. These are all the weapons used in code of honor. My research was stimulated by this often used but unproven axiom that violent games cause more violent behavior, that, that the violence in games can seep out into real world culture and social realities. This is a scene from America's Army. I remember when these guys, I co-founded the Game Design Conference many, many years ago when there were only 50 of us. Um, and I was <laughs> at GDC for uh, the launch of America's Army. And these guys were astounded that the day after they launched the game, walked back in in the morning, and all the soldiers had superpowers. They hacked it to <laughs> make themselves immortal and have gigantic weapons and stuff. Um, once again, the Army missed out on a cyber incident. Um, so they had no way to understand the amount of hacking that it could go on overnight. And they began feverishly rewriting code for several months, actually. It was, it was a war there for them. <laughs> Here we go with America's real army. This is a pilot's view during the Iraq War, the first Iraq War. One pilot said, and we heard this on television, those people of my age, as he dropped a bomb in a screenshot, live video that looked very much like this, that it felt just like a video game. And I think that's how the axiom about violence in video games and training military intelligence and all that jazz got started. This kind of naive belief that violence in games causes violence in real life. Uh, you can kind of see where that was coming from for people, uh, but nobody's proven this. One thing that has pr been shown, at least in some studies, is that 
violent games per se don't seem to be as associated with violent or uncivil behavior as a, a, so if it's a single player violent game or a game in which you're playing only for yourself that is more likely to show up in incivility and violence than violent games that are collaborative where you're working with a, a team of people and I, it's a pretty interesting finding it's the first research I've seen to suggest that so I keep my eye on that one so looking, let's just turn that little axiom inside us and say, well, okay, could this work the other way? If, let's say it's true, violence leaks out of video games. Well, what if, you know, it worked the other way? So this is Endless Forest. Anybody play this? Yes. Yay! <laughs> Yay! <laughs> <laughs> it's, I think it's been out there for about 10 years, uh, has an active online community. There's very little conflict. It's a kind of your gentler game, I guess, here we have. Journey! It's not online, but uh, yeah, is it online? It is? Cool, I did not know that. So the deal is there's no affordances for actual language in this game. So it's really hard to say, you know, your mom wears army boots if you don't have language. <laughs> um, it's, it's difficult to do things that are in your face offensive and aggressive. So here's a case where the designers removed the affordances or for abuse and, and replace them with these lovely affordances for communication <coughs> that are based on gesture and, and music. Here's another example, Never Alone, which is part of the indigenous games communities in efflorescence. Mm. Um, you guys know about this game? So it was, you know, um, designed in collaboration with elders of the Inuit community in, in Alaska. Um, and this lifts up values of like courage and, and joy and honoring the elders and listening to stories and resilience and respect, but it's not a violent game. So wowee, if those things could hatch out into our general culture, wouldn't that be fun? Unfortunately, I don't think it's that easy. Although there, I will make an argument for us spending more time as a community thinking about how we can model civility in online communities and online games. But it's really a chicken and egg problem. So somebody to read, if you're interested in this topic, is Catherine Cross. Um, she believes that virtual systems refract real world, world civility. So they have a, a greater potential for um, evoking incivility than face-to-face -face conversation. You see what I mean? Um, and I'll give you some examples of that. So the question is, you know, how is online civility related to real world, world civility? Is there a dynamic relationship between those two things? Um, that's one question. So I want to start by checking definitions. Um, and here's some just dictionary stuff. So this is what the dictionaries will tell you that this word means. Politeness, courtesy, in behavior and speech, respectful behavior. Training in the humanities is probably closest to the spirit of what the word means, but um, as you can see from the etymology, um, polite, politeness got added fairly late in the history of the word civility. Um, so in its original meanings, it had more to do with being a citizen um, of polis, a city-state. Um, it meant orderly conduct within that context, and then in the mid-16th century, politeness started to get added on to the definition. So <laughs> here's an improper use of politeness in terms of grammar and <laughs> conversation. George Takai was kind enough to post this for us. So <laughs> you can see how being, being civil here as a, a grammar school teacher has really irritated someone. I think it was probably on purpose. Um, anyway. <laughs> I like this definition the best of any that I found. Um, and it's actually from a group, the Institute for Civilian and Government, that is looking at government in particular. We can certainly, by extension, you know, read respect and even empathy into these words. And I think we can apply this definition of civility or something like it uh, to an online domain, <coughs> or an online community. So claiming and caring for your own identity your needs 
and your beliefs, but do it without degrading other people's same of the same as the above. Uh, many of you have probably seen this clip, but I'm going to play it anyway because I think it's awesome. Okay, okay, well, this guy is, awesome. <laughs> is he laughing? Why is that funny? On a roll? This guy's a Muslim. Aren't you fighting against these guys? Not at the moment. I know I'm ordering a sandwich. I don't think it should be working here. Fire yes, chips and move out. He doesn't follow orders. Look, I'd like to order some food. It's not from you, okay? Get out. Put the chips down and go buy them somewhere else. You want me to leave this place? If you have a choice to shop anywhere, just like he has a choice to practice his religion anywhere. That's the reason I wear the uniform. So anyone can live free in this country. Leave the man alone, buy your stuff, and leave. Time to tell this soldier this is one battle he no longer has to fight. Yes, yes, How are you, sir? How are you, sir? I'm John Quinones with ABC's What Would You Do, the TV show. You gotta be kidding me. He was an actor. People might say that's very heroic, what you said, is it? No, sir. No, your heroes come in many shapes and sizes, and that wasn't heroic at all. It was just being a person and standing up for someone else. So, I thought that was a pretty neat little video. Um, even though it's a mock up, you know, he's kind of enacting the definition I just gave you. He is pulling rank a little bit, as you notice. You know, he's saying that's why I wear the uniform. But faced with that situation, say, in a classroom, I would probably pull rank as a teacher. If I had rank to pull, I'd probably pull it. You know, so <laughs> there's, there are many shades of gray around the edges of this notion of civility. That's an example where you see some of the shades of gray in the authority of the soldier. So I'm going to drag you back into history I am to show you some of this where this idea came from, and the earliest example of it is Confucianism that we know about. Um, it, it put Confucianism as maybe, you know, put particular emphasis on the importance of family and social harmony. Um, and, at, and at core, many people have described Confucianism as humanistic. So there is something that's coming to us from 500 before the Common Era. The notion of the polis shows up in Plato's Republic. Um, it's literally the citizens of a city-state, and so civility has to do with an acting one's duty to have conversations, to talk about issues, to vote, etc., in a civil way, so that there aren't big arguments um, that result in wars, for example. Um, Stoicism is a, a really kind of interesting case where civility gets defined, that the definition gets refined a little bit. So the Stoic philosophers in the third century before the Common Era derived their tenets from Plato pretty much, um, justice, temperance, etc. But here's an interesting thing we learned from Foucault, and I'm sure it's in other places, in Care of the Self, Volume 3, uh, that the Epicureans <coughs> said that a person may marry, and the Stoics said they must marry. Now this is, of course, hegemonically heterosexual, but we won't go there now. Um, the idea was that by having a family and taking care of your family and honoring and respecting your family, that was the inward-facing side of the outward-facing side of a person in the polis, you know, in society. So that we, we learn and model civil behavior that then we will take into the community in our civil behavior. We'll set an example for them, the rest of the community, by the way we conduct our lives. I, I just think it's really interesting that you can see this correspondence between, quote, family, I was going to say family <coughs> values, um, and, and society, that they're two sides of the same coin. And there's a way in which that's also true of public versus virtual. Um, so then we come to, many years later, um, <laughs> John Locke's uh, proclamation that civil discourse was for the public good uh, with great 
extensified explanation in this essay concerning human understanding. We see the age of enlightenment. This is interesting. Uh, Dina Goodman, who's a postmodern scholar, and that is the kind of scholar I would not normally quote. I've done it twice now. The full legacy of the Enlightenment helps us to grapple with difference as reasonable men and women. It allows us to see not only that differences are socially constructed, but that society is itself constructed out of differences, and government develops to manage them. I thought that was a pretty straightforward and interesting way to talk about it. Then quickly we get into the notion of a digital commons. Uh, which is maybe a little before most of you were here with us on the planet, but is events today by things like Wikipedia, where we see the digital world as a repository for information and resources for community. Um, and finally, we get to online <coughs> communities that are part of MUDs, moves, blogs, you know, um, games, social networks, etc. So this is an interesting little cascade of, of context, I guess, for civility, and, and also looking at how the definition morphs over time. Um, I find it informative, and if anybody in here is a humanities type, this would be an interesting trip to take more thoroughly. Here are some common principles that your mom and dad probably taught you, but going through them anyway. <laughs> Assume good faith is a really important one, and very hard to do. If somebody sends you an email that sounds like they're pissed off, it's really hard to not say back, well, I don't know what you're pissed off about, <laughs> you know, answer in kind. But if you assume good faith, which takes some work on your part, you often find out that you've misunderstood the other person's tone entirely, primarily because we have no paralinguistics in you know, text-based media. We can't hear the tone of voice. We sometimes can't see the facial expression. I mean, there's this way in which on online communities first paralinguistics are emoticons, you know? And think of all the subtlety we pick up from listening to each other speak, looking at how our heads are positioned. Um, so discourse gets stripped of all that affect and we often fill it in with our own insecurities <laughs> and defensiveness. Um, these other rules I expect you can read. Having an open mind is also very hard right now, all the time, forever. And this one is maybe hardest, especially for women in on online settings, and also minorities and LGBTQ people, is that hiding is the wrong thing to do in terms of civility. In general, speaking up is our duty as civil members of communities, be they online or here. Now, sometimes that costs a lot. I think some of you heard Brianna Wu speak here this year, who has been hounded to death. Um, avoiding escalation is another one that's hard. Piling it on, you know, when somebody tweaks you, it's, it's hard to keep off of the escalation ladder. So why does this matter? Um, the, on the good side of it, we, we all like to play games and have fun. Uh, you know, we like to do cosplay and avatars and stuff like that. We even have spirited civil discourse online a lot of the time, which is really nice. Um, the last point, coordinating civic and political action, is interesting. So Henry Jenkins writes about this in some of his most recent work, that there is now a there are a substantial number of collaborations between fan communities and political communities that are working for causes together. Um, Harry Potter is an example, and I'll show you some more of what the Harry Potter people have been up to. So these guys actually do coordinate political action using <coughs> online communities that may end up in the actual world, in the real world. Uh, he talks about this great um, instance where the, the zombies were having, zombie fans were having a convention in uh, Washington, right near where the original Occupy was set up. And if you recall Occupy, the mascot of Occupy was the vampire, right? So the vampire is in the Occupy, people are talking to the other, 
And the vampires start wandering around the streets, right? Uh, or, I'm sorry, zombies, 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 wandering around the streets. And they run into a couple of old ladies walking along, and, and uh, they say, oh, my, you look so interesting. Can, can, what are you doing out here? Follow me back here. You know? <laughs> and people of all walks of life came back and got exposed to Occupy. And it was because of the zombies. I'm sorry, I said <laughs> vampires to start with. Uh, that's an example. And this one was kind of agitprop. I don't think anybody planned it. But then things that followed on with fans uh, tended to be planned and, and well coordinated. This is part of Henry Jenkins' philosophy that young people will do politics by any media necessary. And that going out to vote is not necessarily one of the things that they do. Uh, so. That, to me, obviously, we've all experienced this, but I'm going to go through it anyway and make you look at it. You know, we have some harms to the public and private good of incivility that are kind of unbearable, uh, in my view. Um, so, this is a message who was received by a non-gay non, non white male with a family who had been advocating for universal health care eight years ago in my he was mobbed, he was gang stalked, he was given death threats on his voicemail. Um, he had to have his, he had to quit his job, move to the East Coast, petition Google to take his home off of Street View. Um, and still, when he was away on business, he would get threats to his family with pictures of his house. And so it came to the point where he had to have, you know, police cars surrounding his home when he wasn't there. Um, this is amazing. I mean, this is to point out that we hear a lot about women being harassed and stalked, and it's true that the majority of the, the cases that we know about are against women and minorities, but this happens to men too. Um, and this happened 10 years ago, so it's not new, you know. Um, we have a problem with what's going on in online games and communities. I can remember when it wasn't, you know, and some of the earliest ones. Uh, so now here's I love this post, the woman is talking about um, her experiences inside of a chat, street fighter, um, after she beat somebody, somebody got a higher score, so that's cool. <laughs> um, we have a greater instance of cyberbullying. This is the kind of thing we were seeing um, in the last five years happening to younger and younger children. Mm -hmm. Children. <laughs> So Anita Sarkeesian, famous Gamergate target, has gone through it all. Harassment, mobbing, death threats, sexual violence, virtual, um, stalker games, snuff porn, online. But these people are kind of the famous ones you hear about. It happens to many more people than we think who aren't necessarily famous people. Now, incivility in media is not a new thing, right? <coughs> Remember learning about, I remember learning about Benjamin Franklin's newspaper. And you know, in the early days of the colonies, there were probably hundreds of newspapers being circulated with a lot of libel and slander and incivility in them. One of the scholars I studied for this talk noted that actually the news was more civil uh, when there were three networks than when it went to cable and there were 25 sources because it turned into a kind of opinionated entertainment oriented thing where it blew apart. That's an interesting thing to think about. Um, harassment is not new. Um, so I think 1976, is that 30 years ago? Um, I took my first job in the game 40, business. 40 um, years ago. 20 years? 40. 40. 40. Oh crap. <laughs> uh, I was going to say. That is hard. Um, yeah, I, I, we were on the control data Plato system. Stop giggling. <laughs> and the very first thing I did was fall into a flame war with some guy who was like famous for plucking other people's nerves and causing long winded disputes. So it's not like arguing viciously with each other is new. <coughs> What's changed is the level of personal abuse, the level of threat that comes out of these conversations and threatens to harm people's lives in the real world. And we know of women who've been diagnosed with PTSD 
as a result of one of these mobbing doxine cases. So even that is a real world consequence. And suicides of kids who have been cyberbullied. So it's not, you know, it's out of the box uh, in some interesting ways. Catherine Cross says that the standard denial that har online harassment matters is that it's just a game. It's not the real world. So what are you so upset about? It's just a game. This isn't reality, except it is for some people, right? People who kill themselves, for example. Um, so then the question becomes, well, how do we design online civility? Can we do that as designers? Let's talk about some gender factors that are pretty important, I think. Um, so I got into the game business, computer game business, as I said, in 1976. That was right around when Pong came out. So we had 2K of RAM. I was doing lip sync animation, 2K RAM, uh, fat pixels, um, converging node structures because we were loading off a cassette tape. Um, anyway, the good old days. It was man space from the beginning, from, from the beginning, and I'm sure you know that. And what's interesting is the pinball world, which preceded the console game world, or sorry, yeah, the arcade game world was really pretty gender integrated. Um, I myself played a lot of pinball, shook a lot of machines. But when we get to arcade games, we see that change radically <coughs> overnight. Um, and part of it, I think, was in those days, women were afraid to put their hands on technology. Something that was mechanical was approachable. Something that was digital was not for a very long time. And these were gender roles that were set out by our culture here. And I'm sure they happened in other cultures as well. So, engineers, <laughs> as you might guess, were mostly men when computer games started being developed. Uh, Space War being the first uh, that anybody knows about, and Alan Kay said that Space War blossomed everywhere there was a, a computer capable of supporting it, um, BBSs, et cetera. This is something I personally experienced, which is like the total vertical integration of, integration of the game design industry. So vertical integration usually is an economic meaning, but I'm talking about gender. The earliest computer games were designed by young men, for young men, and sold in spaces that were frequented by young men. So it was the perfect alignment. And for the longest time, I would hear, you know, producing games in the industry, uh, girls don't play computer games. Are you crazy? Finally, my boss at Interval said, I got an idea. There's what was then a $6 billion market with an empty lot next door. Let's go figure out, you know, what would help girls get their hands on the computer, which is how I got to do the research that I did and eventually start the company that I started. Um, so, The prevalent philosophy now, as far as Catherine Cross's research and other people's show us, is that male gamers co continue to feel themselves to be insiders, generally speaking, and that female gamers are framed by them as invaders of male space. So these are just things to be aware of. It doesn't mean this always has to be true. It doesn't mean it's true of everybody. It, we're talking about trans and uh, Percentages. So, how many of you know about Lambda Mu? Oh, good. And some of you don't even have gray hair. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm going to show you some examples of how people have tried to deal with limiting incivility. Okay, Lambda Mu was developed by uh, Pavel Curtis primarily at Xerox Park as a research project. What's the definition of a Mu? Cow noise. <laughs> Again. <laughs> MUD object oriented it. And MUD stands for multi user dungeon. Yeah. Smart person. Um, <laughs> so, Curtis wanted to study uh, online communities and see if, there, if he could develop a system of governance that made it a safe, playful space for people to be. Um, the system was text based, it was member only. You could use 
uh, pseudonyms. It was anonymous. Architecture was based on Pommel's house. Remember, this is a text game, no pictures. Um, and the community was governed by 10 guys that were called wizards. And they were hot, hot dog software engineers who at first were just being troubleshooters but found themselves increasingly drawn into the governance of the community and doing dispute resolution and stuff like that. Uh, if a dispute couldn't be resolved, if somebody continued to behave really badly, then the, it was the option for a wizard to do something called toading. Um, the person would be thrown out of the game, banned from the game, and a, a little statue is erected in the public square with that person's name across it of a toad. And this was, <laughs> believe it or not, 20 years ago, this was sufficient punishment for being a jerk. Um, <laughs> it doesn't work so much today. So in uh, about two years in, Pavel decided that he felt like more like a babysitter than a, uh, than a community leader. And he wanted to really step back from the governance model. So he told the community, you guys, you're grown-ups. You can govern yourselves. Uh, have at it. From now on, we're not going to have any wizards running around toting people. Except that of a couple months later, uh, there was a character that showed up in the living room who called himself Mr. Bungle and textually described pretty piggy violent intercourse with a couple of the other characters in the world. And a guy named Julian Dibble wrote an article about this in Rolling Stone called uh, A Rape in Cyberspace. There was one guy left with wizard powers and he asked everyone to leave the living room and when they came back there was no longer a player called Mr. Bunko. But, uh, but the wizard walked out the door and didn't come back. Lambda Moon still runs, but uh, Pavel has something interesting to say about it. Whoops, sorry. Here we go. Um, I interviewed him for a book that I was working on recently, <coughs> uh, the rewrite of Computer Engineer. <coughs> Here's what he said. I, you can read it. I think it's really poignant. Um, so he, you know, he's saying people always latch on to new affordances to communicate. And then they come in and they mess that up by being humans. And then we all move on. Uh, but he's expressing this, this desire that we all have. Oh, this time it's pure, you know. This time, this time we've developed a community that's going to be healthy, essentially. So there are a couple of flies in the ointment here that I have to call out. One is anonymity. So a lot of people in popular culture will say that anonymity causes or enables uh, or potentiates online incivility. But then you've got accountability, right? Which is another desire that people have for, for some people who are bad people online to be held accountable for their actions. Um, but, the, but the truth, as Catherine Cross points out, I think is somewhere in between that anonymity can work both as a, a cover for abuse, for an abuser, but also as a shield against it. Um, for a potential victim. And so it's kind of problematic. Um, accountability, you know, all the suggestions about true names get <coughs> people completely crazy at places like Warcraft and, and, and at Blizzard, and, and it's never taken seriously because it's seen as such a hazard to the experience of enjoyment that online players have. Um, well, gosh, there's some other ways than governance to deal with these issues and I'm going to mention a few of them. One is to change the code. Uh, so we're ducking the accountability anonymity question for a minute. Um, Jeffrey Lynn reported at GDC 13 that League of Legends moved to a crowdsourced, still anonymous, tribunal system for uh, un uncivil behavior and that they saw like up to an 80% in decrease in instances of reported incivility. So what happened here is that people were observing what, observing what was going on, tweaked the structure so that the emergent behavior was different, if that makes sense. Uh, and we're seeing more game companies take this kind of responsibility. Um, trying to remember, there's another example. Bioware. Um, so as Celia Pierce says, it, emergent behavior is 
absolutely the product of design. When we were talking about journey, the affordances in the game de constrain what the emergent behaviors can be. And the same thing as to in online communities. So I have a, a modest proposal here. I mean, can we have it both ways? We could say that we were making things that were safer. We couldn't say we were making things that were totally safe, right? But what we could do, in fact, is register people with true names, put it in a secure server, lock it away somewhere in a vault, and put a panic button on the screen, which we did with the Purple Moon, so that if you need it, you got it. This feels a little wrong to me, but it's a thought. Another thought would be much more out front, and that is to make, quote, safer versions of existing platforms. So we could say we have a safer Twitter, if we could talk Twitter into it, where they do this business of registering people and putting their names on a secure server. But the people who move into safer Twitter are people who want to avoid incivility and harassment. And if enough people did that, that would change how we think about Twitter. And it would change how we behave. Um, so quickly, I want to talk about some solution spaces here for individuals and communities that other people have explored, as well as myself. So Catherine Cross again, man, she's great. Uh, if you're interested in this topic, you should read her. Um, she says that one strategy is for opinion leaders online to call out publicly for greater civility in online systems. So, for example, when Jennifer Helper, who was a writer at BioWare, got mobbed and harassed, basically for being a woman, BioWare stood up for her. Um, they condemned the actions, they gave money to anti-harassment charities, etc. So there was an action taken in the real world by somebody that gave us maybe respect, um, that said, no, we're not, we don't approve of this stuff. Um, another great piece of advice for individuals is from Sally Cohn. We often hear, don't feed the trolls. How many people have heard that? Eh? So you got people making harassing remarks, and it's, it's seen to be feeding the trolls when you answer back. So we're trained to go silent, especially women, when this happens. And Catherine Cross says civility will slay the trolls in a lot of cases that if we are afraid and we allow ourselves to be silenced, we're not doing ourselves any favors. You know? And we're probably not gonna change the person at the other end. So that's an interesting heuristic. So here's some other little heuristics. To model civility, what does that mean? You can rephrase a comment to de-escalate an argument. Here's an example. Um, where I basically rephrased <laughs> what the other person was saying into something that was not quite as offensive, but true. Um, and he said, yeah, that's what I meant. <laughs> Problem solved. Right? So that, that's something that can help. Using humor, using, use, using humor in a good spirited way uh, can sometimes also de-escalate a situation and change the emotional tone. Cory Booker is, is a champ at this. He is a senator from New Jersey, junior senator from New Jersey, and he's become famous be, partly because of his amazing civility in tweets, and he answers like all of them. Um, and also for a new book he has produced called, or written called United. So in addition to the humor you see here, he's making we statements. Which reminds me of a story about Winston Churchill at a, at a party uh, in England, and um, this is a story Alan Kay used to tell. And the hostess comes up to Churchill and says, I believe someone's stolen the silver salt and pepper. So Churchill walks over, grabs another silver salt and pepper, puts them in his pocket, goes up to the su suspect, and pulls them out and says, I think we better put these back. <laughs> we statement, right? Mm -hmm. So nobody is shamed, um, but it's out there. Um, stealing isn't a good idea, whatever. Set an example, this is a, an experiment I did uh, with asking a difficult question. If you're reading this conversation, where it could have really gone south is where somebody answered the question about anger, public anger with Fox News. That could have gone way south. You know, that could have been an explosive moment in this discourse. But the next guy pulled it back, reframed it, 
as people watching television at home all the time and being in this constant sort of adrenal fatigue of looking at the bad news. So uh, a great example of modeling civility and avoiding a train wreck. If you mess up, apologize. Own it, you know. So another real life example of a gay man who's been harassed uh, by someone who knows him. So he apologizes back and they're buddies again. Um, engage in what Cory Booker calls courageous empathy. Um, sympathy is not the same as empathy. Sympathy means feeling for somebody, right? I'm sorry for your loss. Empathy means feeling with somebody, into somebody. So you, you're trying your best to share how it must feel to be inside that person and inside their experience. Empathy is harder because for a moment at least you, you, you can drop, you have to drop your own <coughs> sense of privilege um, or any sense of superiority that you may have with the other person. You don't have to drop your self-respect. But to experience empath empathy means an opening up of your heart and yourself that's kind of hard to do, uh, but it's, it's worth the journey. Um, and finally, this quote, Henry Jenkins brought this to my attention. Um, it comes from J.K. Rowling's commencement speech at Harvard in 2008, so I thought I'd just play you a quick clip with context and then we'll do Q&A, okay? If you choose to use your status and influence to raise your voice on behalf of those who have no voice, if you choose to identify not only with the powerful but with the powerless, if you retain the ability to imagine yourself into the lives of those who do not have your advantages, then it will not only be your proud families who celebrate your existence, but thousands and millions of people whose reality you have helped change. We do not need magic to transform our world. We carry all the power we need inside ourselves already. We have the power to imagine better. That's cool. So she's the person behind the Harry Potter books. Okay, so thank you. Question for the raise your hand if you have a question. Or an insult. <laughs> Simon, did you have a question? Well, I don't want to start off, but I guess I will. Nice to see you, Simon. Hi, Hi. Um, yes. Is it on? Okay. I wanted to ask you, and it's 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 on topic. Um, Nancy Jo Sales has recently published a book called American Girls. It's mm -hmm. about girls and social media. Mm -hmm. I heard her interview uh, this week on KCRW. It's quite very impressed. It's a it's a pretty stunning set of new situations for girls. Just wanted to hear your, uh, your, your read on, on that scenario. Well, I haven't, read the, I haven't read the book yet, so, but I will say that certainly, I mean, I had somebody approach me about porting Purple Moon to mobile devices. And I said, do you see a mobile phone in that game anywhere? You know, everything is different uh, for kids that age today. So much is different, at least in terms of their communication affordances. Um, girls have a habit, generally speaking. I'm not a biological essentialist. <laughs> girls tend to have a habit <laughs> of, of establishing social hierarchy among same-sex groups through affiliation and exclusion. Mm -hmm. Whereas males tend to have, uh, you know, fight, punch it out, get it over with, I'm done, I'm not mad anymore, and by the way, all my homies come up with me, you know? Uh, and the latter is kind of an easy transaction. It doesn't hang around and get rancorous as much. And this is on the basis of interviewing a couple thousand kids and some of the research that I saw on primates as well. So if social media actually does refract or magnify incivility in the world, Wow, you've got a microphone on the way girls behave towards each other, you know. So, I mean, there used to be truth books where people would write nasty things about each other and pass the book along. 
then somebody would steal it and show it to you and you go, ah, you know, everybody hates me. Um, it's, it's really amped and it's really pervasive. I, I do know that. I do know that. And with the sexting stuff happening at early and earlier ages, there's a less and little childhood. You know. mm. um, what do you recommend most about, what, what enlightened you most about the book? Or do you want to talk about that later? Uh, well, I, it, 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 it reminded me, because this is, that, that uh, we're dealing with a new uh, digital social phenomenon. And the, the thing that the author was saying was that the girls don't know how to deal with this new situation. So the, the, this, the kind of conventional local social rivalry is migrating out into a context that's potentially international. Mm -hmm. um, and that's very confusing for them. Mm -hmm. um, and also the parents are out of their depth because they don't know the technology. And the author was saying, you know, the, this is sort of n new social territory and, uh, and, and we need to be proactive about it. And I felt the same way. I do too. Part of it is, you know, educating your kids. but. I'm a, I'm a bad example. I showed my kids America X when they were nine or something uh, because I thought they should know what skinheads were. Thank you for your talk. Very, uh, Thank very you. Um, Whitney Phillips has a book uh, on trolling called This is Why We Can't Have Nice Things. And um, she does research onto Facebook trolls and uh, 4chan trolls and uh, kind of goes behind enemy lines and she, <laughs> In, 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 she, in some in some points and at some points it becomes kind of sympathetic to um, the trolls in some ways and like this is this is why uh, uh, harassment is coming out as this um, in, in her book she talks about a moment when naturally her work on trolls attracts trolls to troll her work online on them yeah yes it's kind of like two scoops of chocolate you know it's this extra big mm -hmm. troll, troll, troll right. square. Right, yeah, and she and she details a moment when she gets trolled and how she responds to it, and she uh, talks discusses how she undermines the troll's attempt at trolling, and uh, takes away the, the the platform for 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 the harassment. I'm curious <laughs> if you see this kind of um, troll expertise as something that's scalable to or or learnable. As a uh, as as a response to harassment and trolling, is this a path that that might that might be like um, somewhat similar to assuming good faith or assuming bad faith or you know mm -hmm. a, a, another another strategy for handling harassment? Mm -hmm. I think it depends on the degree. Myself, um, I mean, when somebody is giving me a death threat, I'm going to respond to it a little differently than I would to the usual "you're a dumb bitch." kind of behavior. Um, that said, I do think understanding the, the mentality, the frame of mind, uh, and this sounds like really valuable work that you're describing, of, of folks in the gamer gator harasser troll community is, is useful and it may help us develop new strategies for dealing with those folk. I've had a few encounters that backfired, you know, when somebody will say some awful thing I'll say, must be feeling really bad today. Oh, don't you, you know, tell me how I feel and it blows it. it. So it's like, you know, it's like messing with dynamite, but in this other sense, you kind of have to, unless you're at, at risk of bodily harm, I think. Um, yeah, I think knowing more about who does this is going to help us develop better defenses against it. Thanks for the talk. It was you're great. welcome. Um, when you were talking about anonymity and accountability in online spaces, um, I have done some stuff with identity, specifically for character names and things like that, and the ways that they work for the players and how they're really important and maybe having the real name isn't the best thing. Um, and when I started looking into the workarounds, because you were suggesting, like, do we keep the names in the server or do we do something else? Um, some of the alternatives that I was looking at were things like persistent pseudonymity, where you're locked oh, cool. to one account. Um, but and it's not your real name, so you can protect those sensitive identifiers about yourself. But um, but then there's still the accountability aspects. So it's like okay, well if you keep this one name everywhere, but you know you're a jerk on Twitter and they ban you, you can just make another account. 
um, which led me looking into things where it's like you're locked out. So I don't know, I can't remember the name of the game, but it was this game where it's an FPS, and once you die, you're done, and the game yeah, lost you forever. Yeah, I remember. There were um, a couple of those. They're very shocking to players. Yeah. Um, and so do you see like viability in terms of like online spaces like that, where it's like if you fuck up, you're gone forever and done and locked out of this community, and so there's a lot more... Um, weight attached to the actions that you have, or does that seem too extreme? And, well, I love the idea happens. of a persistent pseudonym because then, you know, the folks over in Warcraft are going to say, hey, we heard you were a dick in League of Legends, so, yeah. yeah. Uh, that's, that's an interesting idea. Uh, it still doesn't mean we can get to that person. Yeah. But we might get them to leave us alone, you know? Okay, there, yeah, I'm, we talked at lunch, and she's doing some great work. <laughs> we should talk more later. Yeah. yeah. You're closest. Sorry. Okay. So I actually want to follow up on that because this is something that I've been thinking about a lot. Um, and I think that I'd love to hear you speak a little bit about disproportionate risk involved in these situations. Because I feel like there's this, this sense online that we're often tiny voices shouting into a hurricane, that, that we have very small amounts of power to change big institutions. And so one of the things that happens, we get groups of angry people banding together to try to change what we perceive as unchangeable institutions. And so as a group, or as a mob, we have very little power when we're dealing with infrastructure institutions. But when we're dealing with individuals, mm -hmm. a mob can mm -hmm. have immense power and they can ruin somebody's life. Mm -hmm. And so strategies developed as, in activist spaces uh, have no efficacy for actually helping us, but they have immense efficacy for destroying each other. And I'm wondering if you could speak Wait, about say that again? That, that, that we often have very little ability to advocate for ourselves against entrenched power structures online, mm -hmm. but we have immense power to destroy each other and tear each other down when it's many to one instead of many to firmament. Sure, sure. That may be true, but I, I'd like to, I guess what I was encouraging <coughs> in the take action, part, you know, uphold civility, the civil right. commons stuff is, oh, we have to be mobbing back. Yeah. You see something like that going on, everybody should make noise about it. Everybody should make noise and not stop, you know. I don't think, I don't see us doing that. We're not very good at it yet. We're not very good at it yet, but, but it's coming along, you know, and I think the more we can align around what we want the quality of life to be in our online spaces, the bigger our voices will be. You know. Yes? Uh, over here. Oh, over here, sorry, yes. Okay. Uh, I was just wondering, like, what are your opinions regarding, like, people who do, like, hacking? Like, whether we're good or bad? Like, what are, like, for example, like, sometimes someone might be a Robin Hood, like, this gives them more, like, you know, bounties or things in game. Or like you might be able to do something else that like the developers are against, but then it might be good for the public. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. What are you? Yeah, we're yeah, gonna have to say it depends. Yeah, <coughs> I think hacking a game like the America's Army hack is is kind of much less important than hacking Citibank or you know the U.S. government. Um, maybe not, but. Uh, I don't want to condemn hacking in general, and Anonymous has this very strange sort of liminal position in society where sometimes I agree with who they go after. At one point, Anonymous made a statement that they were going to go after gamer gamers. Uh, I don't think they did, unfortunately. They probably had too many of them among their ranks. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> you know, occasionally they'll do something that's pretty neat, and it's hard to say, well, no, but... Yeah, I, so it, for me, it's just like a, a, a question of degree, a question of actual harm, a question of reparability that, that comes up. So I don't think I, I, I'm not able to make an absolute statement on hacking. Okay, I think I have three people in the queue right now. <laughs> Hi, thank you for your talk. Thank um, you. You're also polite. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. Um, so I am really interested in thinking more about this dynamic between anonymity and accountability. And, you know, I love this example of persistent <coughs> pseudonym. Um, I think that's 
really at the core of a lot of what we're talking about. And for in my own work, I'm still struggling with how to think about it too. So I just wanted to ask you more about that. I wanted to give you an example from some research that I yeah. did. Um, I studied queer youth of color as uh, they use Tumblr. And one of the ways that I asked them about Tumblr was I asked them about Tumblr versus Facebook. Mm -hmm. And they're scared to death of Facebook because it's not anonymous, right? And I had several queer youth of color um, tell me that they were outed by the system on Facebook because you say that you, you know, want to RSVP to the queer student event, you know, Uncle Joe in Arkansas sees that pop up on his Facebook feed, right? Um, so they found Tumblr uh, with its anonymity to be a much safer space mm -hmm. for them. And yet, obviously, anonymity also contributes to, um, or as you point out, can, can be very harmful. Yeah. So I, I just, I, I don't know how to think about it. I just want to ask you more. What, what more do you think about that dynamic? Well, it cuts both ways. I mean, I'm up in the air. I, I, as I hope I convey in my talk, it's it's still, you know, up for grabs. I think the persistent synonym solution is good. I think we might be able to do something with an escrow server uh, situation that would that would help us retain some information about people. But at the end of the day, game designers design spaces that are comfortable for them. Um, especially independent game designers. And we're seeing so much great new work from the LGBTQ community, both black and other, um, that I've got to think that as these games get traction, um, they're going to become safer communities uh, for people of color and, and non-conforming gender. Um, at least that's my hope. Okay, um, following the protocol on time, um, <clears throat> and that we have a number of people who still have questions, that please hold your questions, that will break uh, out of this room. Please do not go up to the speaker. She'll be available downstairs on the fifth floor, where there'll be refreshments and replenishments and time uh, to ask your questions. So, I strongly encourage you, if you didn't get a chance to ask your question, to you know, just after the end, you know, go downstairs and there'll be uh, time. But at this point, I'd again like to thank Brenda for giving us an incredible